Warning, the video you are about to watch may contain language and scenarios of a highly adult nature and is therefore not intended for children under the age of 18. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey guys, what's up? This is Couch Potato Mike back in the book club for Chapter 3, Part 1. It's a really long one. Of Darker. By E.L. James. I am so glad to be back in the book club. Uh, now, I'm only doing half of this chapter because this is a really freaking long chapter. Yeah, it's really long. So, sorry, guys. So, yeah, cha uh, chapter three, part one. Uh, before we start up uh, with this, I want to remind you guys to subscribe if you haven't. Hit that thumbs up button if you haven't done that. And leave a comment down below if you've never done that before. Uh, I want to thank you guys for sticking uh, with me through this. I enjoy reading all your comments. I really do. Like and subscribe and ring that bell icon and all that good stuff. You know, all the stuff that all the YouTubers say to, you know, we don't say that stuff for no reason. We need it. We're, we're trying to make a living off this stuff. See, my goal is to get monetized off of YouTube and get paid and get paid enough where I don't have to have a day job. I know it's a lofty goal, considering what I do, but it's a goal nonetheless. We all have to have goals. You know, something helps us wake up in the morning. Right. Where was I? Oh, yes. Darker by E.L. James, Chapter 3, Part 1, <clears throat> which takes place... <clears throat> Let me get comfortable. <clears throat> Which takes place on Saturday, June the 11th of 2011. Sorry, I almost fell off my bed. Didn't want to have a different kind of video here. <clears throat> Anne is beside me, radiant, lovely, mine. She's dressed in a white and satin robe. We're in Charlie Tango, chasing the dawn, chasing the dusk. Chasing the dawn, the dusk, high above the clouds we fly. Night, a dark shroud arching over us. Anna's hair is burnished, titanium bright. Sorry, Titian bright from the setting sun. We have the world at our feet, and I want to give her the world. She's entranced. I do a wing over, and we're in my glider. See the world, Anna. I want to show you the world. She laughs, giggling happy. Her braids pointing to the ground when she's upside down. Again, she calls, and I oblige. We roll and roll and roll. But this time she starts screaming. She start, she's staring at me in horror. Her face is contorted, horrified, disgusted at me. Me? No. No! She screams. I awake and my heart is pounding. Anna is tossing and turning beside me, making an eerie, unworldly sound that rouses every hair follicle on my body. In the glow of the ambient streetlight, I see she stole sleep. I sit up and shake her gently. Jesus, Anna. She wakes suddenly, gasping, eyes wild, terrified. Baby, are you okay? You were having a bad dream. Oh, she whispers. As she focuses on me, her lashes fluttering like the wings of a hummingbird. I reach over her and switch on her lamp. She squints in a half-light. The girl, she says, her eyes searching mine. What is it? What girl? I resist the urge to gather her in my arms and kiss her away her nightmares. She blinks once more. And her voice is clear, less fearful. There was a girl outside SIP when I left this evening. She looked like me, but not really. My scalp tingles. Layla. When was this? I ask, setting upright. When I left work this evening. She's shaken. Do you know who she was? Yes. What the hell is Layla doing confronting Anna? Who? Anna asks. I should call Welch. During our update this morning, he had nothing to report on Layla's whereabouts. His team is still, his team is still trying to find her. Who? Anna persists. Damn. I know she won't stop until she has some answers. Why the hell did she tell me this earlier? It's Layla. Her frown deepens. The girl who put Toxic on your iPod? Yes. Did she say anything? She said 
what do you have that I don't? And when I asked who she was, she said, I'm nobody. Christ, Layla, what are you playing at? I have to call Welch. I stumble out of bed and slip on my jeans. In the living room, I retrieve the phone from the pocket of my jacket. <clears throat> Welch answers the two rings, and any hesitation I had about calling him at five in the morning disappears. He must have been awake. Mr. Gray, he says in a voice hoarse as usual. Sorry to call you so early. I begin pacing at the space I have in the kitchen. Sleep's not really my thing, Mr. Gray. I figured. It's Layla. She accosted my girlfriend, Anastasia Steele. Was it at her office or at her apartment? When did it happen? Yes, outside SIP earlier this evening. I turn and Anna, dressed only in my shirt, is standing in the kitchen by the kitchen counter watching me. I study her as I continue my conversation, her expression a mixture of curious and haunted. She looks beautiful. <clears throat> what time exactly? Welch asks. I repeat the question to Anna. About ten to six, she says. Did you get that? I ask Welch. No. Ten to six, I repeat. So she's tracked Miss Steele to her work. Find out how. There are press pho photographs of the two of you together. Yes. Anna tilts her head to one side and tosses her hair over her shoulder as she listens to my side of the conversation. <clears throat> Do you think we should be concerned for Miss Steele's safety? Welch inquires. I, w I, would have s I wouldn't have said so, but then I wouldn't have thought she could do this. I think you should consider additional security for us, sir. I don't know how that will go down. I look at Anna as she folds her arms, accentuating the outline of her breasts as they strain against the white cotton of my shirt. I'd like to increase your security too, sir. Will you ask it? Will you talk to Anastasia? Tell her the danger she might be in? Yes, I'll talk to her. Anna bites her lip. I wish she'd stop. It's distracting. Welch continues. I'll brief Mr. Taylor and Mrs. Jones at the more reasonable hour. Yes. In the meantime, I'm going to need more personnel on the ground. I know. I sigh. We'll start with the stores in the vicinity of SIP. See if anyone saw anything. This could be the lead we've been waiting for. Follow it up and let me know. Just find her, Welch. She's in trouble. Find her. I hang up and look at Anna. Her tangled hair tumbles over her shoulders. Her long legs are pale in the dim light from the hallway. I imagine them wrapped around me. Do you want some tea? She asks. Actually, I'd like to go back to bed and forget all this crap about Layla. Well, I need some tea. Would you like to join me for a cup? She moves to the stove, picks up the kettle, and begins to fill, fill it with water. I don't want fucking tea. I want to bury myself in you. Forget about Layla. Anna gives me a pointed look and I realize she's waiting for an answer about tea. Yes, please. Even in my own ears, I sound surly. What does Layla want with Anna? And why the hell hasn't Welch found her? What is it? Anna asks a few minutes later. She's holding a familiar looking teacup. Anna, please, I don't want you to don't worry about this. You're not going to tell me? She persists. No. Why? Because it shouldn't concern you. I don't want you tangled up in this. It shouldn't concern me, but it does. She found me and accosted me outside my office. How does she know about me? How does she know where I work? I think I have a right to know what's going on. She has an answer for everything. Please, she presses. Oh, Anna, 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 why do you do this? Her bright blue eyes beseech me. Fuck, I can't say no to that look. Okay, you win. I have no idea how she found you. Maybe the photograph of us in Portland, I don't know. With some reluctance, I continue. While I was with you in Georgia, Layla turned up at my apartment unannounced and made a scene in front of Gail. Gail? Mrs. Jones. Uh, what do you mean, made a scene? I shake my head. Tell me. She puts her hands on her hips. You're keeping something back. And uh, I... Why is she so mad? I don't want her mixed up in this. Why doesn't she understand that Layla's shame is my shame? Layla chose to attempt suicide in my apartment, and I wasn't there to help her. She cried out to me for a reason. Please, Anna prompts again. She won't give up. I sigh with an exasperation and tell her that Layla made a haphazard attempt at suicide. Oh, no. Gail got her to the hospital, but Layla discharged herself before I could get there. The shrink who saw her called it a typical cry for help. 
He didn't believe her to be truly at risk, one step away from suicidal ideation, he called it. But I'm not convinced. I've been trying to track her down since then to get her some help. Did she say anything to Mrs. Jones? Not much. You can't find her? What about her family? No, they don't know where she is. Neither does her husband. Husband? She exclaims. Yes, that lying asshole. She's been married for about two years. So she was with you while she was married? No, God, no. She was with me nearly three years ago. Then she left and married this guy shortly afterward. I told you, baby, I don't share. I've only tangled with one married woman, and that didn't end well. So why is she trying to get your attention now? I don't know. All we've managed to find out is that she ran out on her husband about four months ago. Anna picks up a teaspoon and waves it as she talks. Let me get this straight. She hasn't been your submissive for three years. About two and a half years. And she wanted more? Yes. But you didn't. You know this. So she left you? Yes. So why is she coming to you now? I don't know. She wanted more, but I couldn't give that to her. Maybe she's seen me with you? But you suspect... I suspect it has something to do with you. But I could be wrong. Now, can we get back to bed? Anna stutters me, surveying my chest. But I ignore her scrutiny and ask the question that's been nagging me since she told me about... She, since she told me she'd seen Layla. Why didn't you tell me yesterday? Anna has the grace to look guilty. I forgot, I forgot about her. You know, drinks after work at the end of my first week? You turning up at the bar in your testosterone rush with Jack? <clears throat> she gives me a shy smile. And then when we were here, it slipped my mind. You have a habit of making me forget things. I'd like to forget this now. Let's go back to bed. Testosterone rush. I repeat amused. Yes, the pissing contest? <clears throat> I'll show you a testosterone rush. My voice is low. Wouldn't you rather have a cup of tea? She offers me a cup. No, Anastasia. I wouldn't. I want you now. Forget about her. Come. I hold up my hand as she sets the teacup back on the counter and puts her hand in mine. Back, back in her bedroom, I slide my shirt over her head. I slide my shirt over her head. I like you wearing my clothes, I whisper. I like wearing them. They smell of you. I grasp her hand between I grasp her head between my hands and kiss her. I want to make her forget about Layla. I want to forget about Layla. I pick her up and walk her to the concrete wall. Wrap your legs around me, baby, I order. Before I continue, I just want to add a little side note. And this is I I really love this part right here where she's like, I like wearing your clothes. They smell of you. Uh, because not to get too personal. Almost every day, I find my wife doing housework in the t-shirt that I was wearing the night before, right before I went to bed. Like, this shirt, she'll probably be wearing sometime tomorrow. She likes wearing my clothes, and she says it's for the same reason. And it's just one of the wonderful things that I really, truly do love about my wife. Men really, really love that. So, women, ladies out there, if you want to just give your little man, give your man a little bit of an ego boost, slip into one of his shirts. Trust me, he won't mind. <clears throat> when I open my eyes, the room is bathed with light and Anna is awake beside me, tucked in the crook of my arm. Hi, she says, and grinning as if she's up to some mischief. Hi, I respond cautiously. Something is off. What are you doing? Looking at you. She skims her hand down my belly and my body comes to life. Whoa! I grab her hand. Surely she's sore from yesterday. She licks her lips and her guilty grin is replaced with a knowledgeable, carnal smile. Maybe not. Waking up beside Anastasia Steele has definite advantages. Rolling on top of her, I grab her hands and pin her to the bed as she wriggles beneath me. I think you're up to no good, Miss Steele. I like being up to no good near you. <clears throat> she may as well be addressing my groin directly. You do. I give her a quick peck on the lips. She nods. Oh, you beautiful girl. Sex for breakfast? She tilts her hips to meet mine, and it takes all my self-control not to take what she's offering straight away. No, make her wait. 
Good choice. I kiss her throat, her clavicle, her sternum, her breast. Ah, she breathes. <clears throat> we lie in the afterglow. I don't remember moments like this before, Anna. I didn't lie in bed just being. I nuzzle her hair. All that's changed. She opens her eyes. Hi. Hi. Are you sore, I ask? Her cheek's pink. No, tired. I stroke her cheek. You didn't get much sleep last night. Neither did you. Her smile is 100% coy Miss Steele, but her eyes cloud. I haven't been sleeping well recently. Remorse, swift and ugly, flares in my gut. I'm sorry, I reply. Don't apologize. It was my... I place my finger on her mouth. Hush. She purses her lips together to kiss my finger. If it's any consolation, I confess. I haven't swept, slept this well in the past week either. Oh, Christian, she says in taking my hand, kisses each knuckle in turn. It's an affectionate, humble gesture. My throat constricts as my head expands. I'm on the edge of something unknown. A plane with a horizon disappears and the territory is new and unexplored. It's terrifying. It's confusing. It's exciting. What are you doing to me, Anna? Where are you leading me? I take a deep breath and focus on the woman beside me. She gives me a sexy smile and I can see us spending the entire day in bed. But I realize I'm hungry. Breakfast? I ask. Are you offering to make breakfast or demanding to be fed, Mr. Gray? She teases. Neither. I'll buy you breakfast. I'm no good in the kitchen, as I demonstrated last night. You have other qualities, she says with a playful smirk. Well, Miss Steele, whatever do you mean? She narrows her eyes. I think you know. She's teasing me. She sits up slowly, swinging her legs out of bed. You can shower in Kate's bathroom. It's bigger than mine. Of course it is. I'll use yours. I like being in your space. I like you being in my space, too, she winks. Gets up and struts out of the bedroom, brazen Anna. <clears throat> when I return from the cramped shower, I find Anna dressed in jeans and a tight t-shirt that leaves little to my imagination. She's messing with her hair. As I yank on my jeans, I feel the Audi keys in my pocket. I wonder how she'll react when I give it back to her. She seemed to take the iPad well. How, of how often do you work out? She asks, and I realize she's watching me in the mirror. Every weekday? What do you do? Run, weights, kickboxing? Sprinting to and from your apartment for the past week? Kickboxing, she queries. Yes, I have a personal trainer, an ex-Olympic contender, who teaches me. His name is Claude. He's very good. I tell Anna that, that she'd like him as a trainer. Why would I need a personal trainer? I have you to keep me fit. I walk over to where she stands, still fiddling with her hair, and I embrace her. Our eyes meet in the mirror. But I want you fit, baby, for what I have in mind. I'll need, to, I'll need you to keep up. That's if we ever get back into the playroom. She arches a brow. You know you want to. I mouth the words at her reflection. She toys with her lip, but then breaks our eye contact. <clears throat> what? I ask, concerned. Nothing, she says and shakes her head. Okay, I'll meet Claude. You will? That was easy. Yes, geez, if it makes you that happy, she says and laughs. I squeeze her and give her a peck on the cheek. You have no idea. I kiss her behind her ear. So what would you like to do today? I'd like to get my hair cut and um, I need a bank... I need to bank a check and buy a car. Ah, here goes. From my jeans pocket, I fish out the Audi keys. It's here, I inform her. She looks blank, but then her cheek's pink and I realize she's upset. What do you mean it's here? Taylor brought it back yesterday. She steps out of my embrace, scowling at me. Shit, she's pissed. Why? From the back pocket of her jeans, she brandishes an envelope. Here, here, this is yours. Oh, 
Here, this is yours. I recognize it as the envelope that I put the check in for her ancient beetle. I lift both hands and step away. Oh no, that's your money. No, it isn't. I'd like to buy the car from you. What the hell? She wants to give me money? No, Anastasia. Your money, your car. No, Christian. My money, your car. I'll buy it from you. Oh, no, you don't. I gave you that car for your graduation present, and you said you'd accept it. If you'd given me a pen, that would have been a suitable graduation present. You gave me an Audi. Do you really want to argue about this? No. Good. Here are the keys. I place her keys on the dresser. That's not what I meant. End of discussion, Anastasia. Don't push me. The look she gives me now says it all. If I were dry tender, I would burst into flames and not in a good way. She's mad. Really mad. Suddenly, she narrows her eyes and gives me a wicked smile. Taking the envelope, she holds it aloft and in a rather theatrical manner, rips it in half and in half again. She drops the contents into her trash basket and gives me a victorious fuck you look. Oh, game on, Anna. You are, as ever, challenging this steel. I echo the words she used yesterday and turn to my heel and head into the kitchen. Now I'm pissed. Fucking pissed. How dare she? I find my phone and call Andrea. Good morning, Mr. Gray. She sounds a little breathless when she answers. Hi, Andrea. In the background, on her side of the call, I hear a woman shouting, Doesn't he realize you're getting married today, Andrea? Andrea's voice comes through. Excuse me, Mr. Gray. Married? There's the sound of muffled fumbling. Mom, be quiet. It's my boss. The muffling ceases. What can I do for you, Mr. Gray? She says. You're getting married? Yes, sir. Today? Yes. What is it that you want me to do? I wanted you to deposit $24,000 in Anastasia Steele's bank account. 24000 Yes, $24,000, directly. I'll take care of it. It will be in her account on Monday. Monday? Yes, sir. Excellent. Anything else, sir? No, that's all, Andrea. I hang up aggravated that I've disturbed her on her wedding day and more aggravated that she didn't tell me she was getting married. Why would she tell me? Is she pregnant? Will I have to find a new PA? I turn to Miss Steele, who is, fu who is fuming on the threshold. Deposit it into your bank account on Monday. Don't play games with me. $24,000? She shouts. And how do you know my account number? I know everything about you, Anastasia. I reply, trying to keep my cool. There's no way my car was worth $24,000, she counters. I would agree with you, but it's about knowing your market, whether you're buying or selling. Some lunatic out there wanted that death trap and was willing to pay that amount of money. Apparently, it's a classic. Ask Taylor if you don't believe me. We glower at each other. Impossible woman. Impossible. Impossible. Her lips part. She's breathless. Her pupils dilated, drinking me in, consuming me. Anna. Her tongue licks her lower lip. And there, and it's there in the air between us. Our attraction. A living force. Building. Building. Fuck. I grab her and push her against the door. Pre my lips sinking and seeking and finding hers. I claim her mouth, kissing her greedily. My fingers closing around the nape of her neck, holding her. Her fingers are in my hair, pulling, directing me while she kisses my back. Kisses me back. Her tongue in my mouth, taking everything. I, taking everything. I cup her behind and pull her against my erection and grind my body into hers. I want her again. Why? Why do you defy me? I say out loud as I kiss her neckline. She tilts her head back to give me full access to her throat. Because I can, she whispers. Ah, she stole my line. I'm panting when I lean my forehead against hers. Lord, I want to take you now, but I'm out of condoms. I can never get enough of you, you maddening, maddening woman. And you make me mad, she breathes, in every way. I take a deep breath and look down into dark, hungry eyes that promise me the world, and I shake my head. Steady, Gray. Come, let's go out for breakfast. And I know a place where you can get your hair cut. Okay, she smiles, and we fight no more. 
We walk hand we walk hand in hand up Vine Street and turn right onto First Avenue. I wonder how normal it is to go from seething at each other to this casual calm I feel as we walk through the streets. Maybe most couples are like this. I look down at Anna beside me. This feels so normal, I tell her. I love it. Christian, I think Dr. Flynn would agree that you are anything but normal. Exceptional, maybe. She squeezes my hand. Exceptional. It's a beautiful day, she adds. It is. She briefly closes her eyes and turns her face to the morning sun. Come, I know a great place for brunch. One of my favorite cafes is only a couple of blocks from Anna's on first. When we get there, I open the door for Anna and pause to inhale the smell of fresh bread. What a charming place, she says when we sit down at a table. I love the art on the walls. They support a different artist every month. I found Troughton here. Raising the ordinary to extraordinary? Anna asks. You remembered. There's very little I could forget about you, Mr. Gray. And I, you, Miss Steele, you are extraordinary. I chuckle and hand her a menu. I'll get this. Anna grabs the check before I do. You have to be quick around here, Gray. You're right, I do, I grumble. Someone who owes more than $50,000 in student loan debt should not be paying for my breakfast. Don't look so cross. I'm $24,000 richer than I was this morning. I can afford, she inspects the bill, $22.67 for breakfast. Short of wrestling the check from her, there's little I can do. Thank you, I mutter. Where to now, she asks. You really want your hair cut? Yes, look at it. Dark tendrils have escaped from her ponytail, framing her beautiful face. You look lovely to me, you always do. There's your father's function this evening. A reminder that it's black tie and at my parents' house. They have a tent, you know, the works. What's the charity? It's a drug rehab program for parents with young kids called Coping Together. I hold my breath, hoping that she doesn't start to ask me about the great connection to this cause. It's personal, and I don't need her pity. I've told her all I want to tell her about that time in my life. Sounds like a good cause, she says with compassion, and thankfully leaves it there. Come, let's go. I stand and hold up my hand and in the conversation. Where are we going, she asks as we continue our walk down First Avenue. Surprise. I can't tell her it's Elena's place. I know she'll freak. From our conversation in Savannah, I know the mere mention of her name is a hot button for Anna. It's Saturday, and Elena doesn't work on weekends. And when she does work, it's at the salon in the Bravern Center. Here we are. I open the door to a Sklava and usher Anna in. I haven't been here in a couple of months. Last time was with Susanna. Good morning, Mr. Gray. Greta greets us. Hello, Greta. Is this the usual, sir? She asks politely. Fuck. No, I give Anna a nervous look. Miss Steele will tell you what she wants. Anna's eyes are on me, burning with insight. Why here, she demands. I own this place, and three more like it. You own it? Yes, it's a sideline. Anyway, whatever you want, you can have it here, on the house. I run through all the spa treatments available. All that stuff that women like. Everything. It's done here. Waxing? For a split second, I think about recommending the chocolate wax on her pubic hair. But given our detente, I keep my suggestion, my suggestion to myself. Yes, waxing too, everywhere. Anna blushes. How will I ever convince her to have convince her that penetrative sex would be more pleasurable without for her without the hair? One step at a time, Gray. I'd like a haircut, please, she says to Greta. Certainly, Miss Steele. Greta concentrates on her computer and punches a few keys. Franco is free in five minutes. Franco's fine, I confirm, but notice Anna's demeanor has suddenly changed. I'm about to ask what's wrong when I glance up and see Elena walking out of the back office. Hell, what's she doing here? Elena has a quick word with one of her employees, then spies me and lights up like Christmas, her expression one with, of wicked delight. Shit. Excuse me, I say to Anna and hurry to meet Elena before she makes her way to us. Well, this is an unexpected pleasure. Elena purrs in greeting as she kisses me on both cheeks. Good morning, ma'am. I wasn't expecting to see you here. My aesthetician called in sick. 
So, you have been avoiding me. I've been busy. I can see. Is that someone new? That is Anastasia Steele. Elena beams at Anna, who is watching us intently. She knows that we're talking about her, and she responds with a lukewarm smile. Damn. You're a little southern belle? Elena asks. She's not southern. I thought you went to Georgia to see her. Her mom lives there. I see. She certainly looks your type. Yeah, let's not go there. Are you going to introduce me? Anna's talking to Greta, grilling her, I think. What's she asking? I don't think that's a good idea. Elena looks disappointed. Why not? She's named you Mrs. Robinson. Oh, really? That's funny. Though I'm surprised someone that young even knows the reference. Elena's tone is wry. I'm also astonished you told her about us. What's happened to confidentiality? She taps a scarlet fingernail against her lip. She's not going to talk. I hope so. Look, don't worry. I'll back off. She holds her hands up and surrender. Thank you. But is this a good idea, Christian? She's hurt you once already. Elena's face is etched with concern. I don't know. I missed her. She missed me. I've decided I'm going to try it her way. She's willing. Her way? Are you sure you can? Are you sure you want to? Anna's staring at us. She's alarmed. Time will tell, I answer. Well, I'm here if you need me. Good luck. She gives me a soft but calculated smile. Don't be a stranger. Thanks. Are you going to my parents' soiree this evening? I don't think so. It's probably a good idea. She looks momentarily surprised but says, Let's catch up later this week when we can talk more freely. Sure. She squeezes my arm and I head back to Anna, who is still waiting by the reception desk. Her face is pinched and her arms are folded across her body as she radiates her displeasure. This is not good. Are you okay? I ask, knowing full well that she isn't. Not really. Why didn't you introduce me? She replies in a tone that's so sarcastic and that's both sarcastic and indignant. Christ, she knows it's Elena. How? But I thought Anna interrupts me. For a bright man, sometimes she stops, mid-sentence, too angry to continue. I'd like to go, please. She taps her foot against the marble floor. Why? You know why, she snaps and rolls her eyes as if I'm the biggest idiot she's ever met. You are the biggest idiot she's ever met, Gray. You know how she feels about Elena. Everything was going so well. Make this right, Gray. I'm sorry, Anna. I, I didn't know she'd be here. She's never here. She has opened a new branch in the Bravern Center, and that's where she's normally based. Someone was sick today. Anna turns abruptly and storms to the door. We won't need Franco, Greta. I inform the receptionist, annoyed that she may have heard our exchange. Hastily, I go after Anna. She wraps her arms around herself defensively and marches up the street with her head down. I'm forced to take longer strides to catch up with her. Anna, stop. You're overacting. She simply doesn't understand the nature of Elena's and mine's relationship. As I walk beside her, I'm floundered. What do I do? What do I say? Perhaps Elena is right. Can I do this? I've never tolerated this kind of behavior from any submissive. What's more, none of them have been this petulant. But I hate it when she's angry with me. You used to take your subs there? She asks, and I don't know if it's a rhetorical question or not. I chance a reply. Some of them, yes. Layla? Yes. The place looks very new. It's been refurbished recently. I see. So Mrs. Robinson's met all your subs? Yes. Did they know about her? Not in the way you're thinking. They never knew about our DS relationship. They just thought we were friends. No, none of them did. Only you. But I'm not your sub. No, most you most definitely are not. Because I certainly wouldn't indulge this behavior from anyone else. She stops suddenly and whirls around to face me, her expression bleak. Can you see how fucked up this is? She says. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't know she was going to be there. I want to get my hair cut, preferably somewhere where you haven't fucked either the staff or the clientele. Her voice is hoarse and she's on the verge of tears. Anna. Now, if you'll excuse me, she turns to go. You're not running, are you? Panic starts to well inside me. This is it. She's out before we can even get a second chance. Gray, you've blown it. 
No, she shouts, exasperated. I just want a damn haircut. Somewhere I can close my eyes and have someone wash my hair, and I can forget about all this baggage that accompanies you. She's not leaving me. I take a deep breath. I can have Franco come to the apartment or your place, I offer. She's very attractive. Christ, not this. Yes, she is. So what? Give it up, Anna. Is she still married? No. She got divorced about five years ago. Why aren't you with her? Anna, let it go. Because that's over between us. I've told you this. How many times do I need to tell her? My phone vibrates in my jacket pocket. I hold a finger up to stop her tirade and answer the phone. The caller ID says it's Welch. I wonder what, it, what he has to report. Mr. Gray. Welch. Three things. They've tracked Miss Layla Reed to Spokane. What? Excuse me, guys. Sorry, that was weird. They trapped Miss... Hold on. We've tracked Miss Layla Reed to Spokane, where she'd been living with a man named Jeffrey Berry. He was killed in an auto accident on 990. Killed in a car crash? When? <clears throat> Four weeks ago. Her husband, Russell Reed, knew about it, Barry, but still won't disclose when Miss Reed is gone. <coughs> That's twice that bastard's not been forthcoming. He must know. Does he, ha does he have no feelings for her whatsoever? I'm staggered that her ex could be so heartless. He has feelings for her, but they're certainly not matrimonial. This is beginning this is beginning to make sense. Did the psychiatrist give you anything to go on, Welch asks. No. Could she be suffering a kind of psychosis? I agree with Welch that, that might be her condition, but it still doesn't explain where she is, which is what I really want to know. I look around. Where are you, Layla? She's here. She's watching us, I mutter. Mr. Gray, we're close. We'll find her. Welch tries to reassure me and ask if I'm at a scala. No, I wish Anna and I weren't so exposed here on the street. I'm considering how many people you need for your close pro protection team. Two or four, 24-7. Okay, Mr. Gray. Have you told Anastasia? I haven't broached that yet. Anna's watching me, listening. Her expression is intense, but inscrutable. You should. There's something else. Mrs. Reed has obtained a concealed weapons license. What? Fear grips my heart. The details came up in a search this morning. I see. When? Stated yesterday. That recently? But how? She forged the papers. No background checks? <clears throat> All the forms are fake. She's using a different name. I see. Email me the name, address, and the photos if you have them. We'll do, and I'll organize the additional security. 24-7, from this afternoon, establish liaison with Taylor. I hang up. This is serious. Well, Anna asks. That was Welch. Who's Welch? My security advisor. Okay, so what's happened? Layla left her, hus her husband about three months ago and ran off with a guy who was killed in a car accident four weeks ago. Oh. The asshole shrink should have found that out. Grief, that's what this is. Damn, the hospital could have done a better job. Come, I hold up my hand and Anna takes it without thinking. Then, just as abruptly, she snatches her hand away. Wait a minute. We were in the middle of a discussion about us, about her. You're Mrs. Robinson. She's not my Mrs. Robinson. We could talk about it at your place. I don't... We could talk about it at my place. I don't want to go to your place. I want to get my hair cut. She yells. I take my phone and call the salon. Greta answers immediately. Greta, Christian Gray, I want Franco at my place in an hour. Ask Mrs. Lincoln. Yes, Mr. Gray. She puts me on hold for a nanosecond. That's fine. He can be there at one. Good. I hang up. He's coming at one. Christian! Anna glares at me. Anastasia, Layla is obviously suffering a psychotic break. I don't know if it's you or me she's after, or what length she's prepared to go to. We'll go to your place, pick up a few things, and you can stay with me until we've tracked her down. Why would I want to do that? So I can keep you safe. But... Give me strength. You are coming back to my apartment if I have to drag you there by your hair. I think you're overreacting. I don't. We can continue our discussion back at my place. Come. She glowers at me, intractable. 
No, she says. You can walk or I can carry you. I don't mind either way, Anastasia. You wouldn't dare. Oh, baby, we both know that if you don't throw down the gauntlet, I'll be only too happy to pick it up. She narrows her eyes. Anna, you give me no choice. I scoop her up and throw her over my shoulder, ignoring the startled look of a couple walking past us. Put me down, she rages and starts to struggle. I tighten my hold on her and slap her behind. Christian, she screeches. She's mad, but I don't give a fuck. An alarmed man, a father, I presume, pulling his young children out of our path. I'll walk, I'll walk, she shrieks, and I put her down immediately. She whirls around so fast her hair hits my shoulder. She stomps off in the direction of her apartment and I follow, but I keep watch everywhere. Where are you, Layla? Behind a parked car, a tree? What do you want? Anna comes to a sudden stop. What's happened, she demands. What do you mean? What now? With Layla, I've told you. No, you haven't. There's something else. You didn't insist that I go to your place yesterday, so what's happened? Perceptive Miss Steele. Christian, tell me! She's managed to obtain a concealed weapons permit yesterday. Her whole demeanor changes. Anger turns to fear. That means she can just buy a gun. She whispers, horrified. Anna, I pull her into my arms. I don't think she'll do anything stupid, but I just don't want to take that risk with you. Not me. What about you? She says, her voice filled with anguish. She wraps her arms around me and hugs me hard. She's scared for me. Me? And a moment ago, I thought she was leaving. This is unreal. Let's get back. I kiss her hair. As we move on, I extend my arm around her shoulders and pull her to my side to protect, protect her. She slips her hand into, my belt, into the belt loops of my jean, holding me close. Her fingers curled around my hip. This proximity is new. I could get used to it. We walk back to her apartment, and I keep an eye out for Layla. I contemplate the range of emotions I've experienced since walking, since waking as I watch Anna pack a small suitcase. In the alley the other day, I tried to articulate how I felt. The best I could do was unsettled, and that still describes my psyche right now. Anna is not the mild woman I remember. She's far more audacious and volatile. She's changed so much since she left. She's changed so much since since she left me. Or have I? It doesn't help that there's a whole new level of disquiet because of Layla. For the first time in a long time, I'm fearful. What if something were to happen to Anna because of my association with Layla? That whole situation is out of my control and I don't like it. Anna, for her part, is solemn and unusually quiet. She folds the balloon into her backpack. Charlie Tango's coming with us, too? I tease. She nods and gives me a tepid smile. She's either scared or still mad about Elena. Or she's pissed for being hoisted over my shoulder in the street. Or maybe it's the $24,000. Damn, there's a great deal to choose from. Wish I knew what she was thinking. Ethan is back Tuesday, she says. Ethan? Kate's brother. He's staying here until he finds a place in Seattle. Ah, the other Kavanaugh progeny. The beach bum. I met him at a graduation. He had his hands all over Anna. Well, it's good that you'll be staying with me. Give him more room. I don't know that he's got keys. I'll need to be back then. That's everything, she says. Taking her case, I have a quick look around before we lock up. I note with displeasure that the apartment has no intruder alarm. The Audi is parked out back where Taylor said it would be. I open the passenger door for Anna, but she stays rooted to the ground, staring at me. Are you getting in? I ask, confused. I thought I was driving. No, I'll drive. Something wrong with my driving? She asks. And there's that tone again. <clears throat> Don't tell me you know what I scored on my driving test. I wouldn't be surprised with your stalking tendencies. Get in the car, Anastasia. My patience is running thin. Enough. You're making me crazy. I want you home where you'll be safe. Okay, she huffs and climbs in. She doesn't live far from me, so our ride shouldn't take long. Normally, I would enjoy driving the small Audi. It's nimble in Seattle's traffic, but I'm distracted by every pedestrian. One of them could be Layla. Were all your submissives brunettes? Anna asks out of nowhere. Yes, but I don't really want to discuss this. 
Our fledgling relationship is moving into dangerous territory. I just wondered. She's fidgeting with a tassel on her backpack. Fidgeting means she's apprehensive. Put her at ease, Gray. I told you, I prefer brunettes. Mrs. Robinson isn't a brunette. That's probably why. She put me off blondes forever. You're kidding. Anna's disbelief is obvious. Yes, I'm kidding. Do we really have to talk about this? My anxiety multiplies. If she keeps digging, I'll confess my darkest secret. No, I can never tell her. She'll leave me. Without a backward glance. And I recall watching her walk up the street and into the garage at the Heathman after our first coffee. She never looked back, not once. If I hadn't contacted her about the photographer's show, I wouldn't be with her now. Anna's strong. If she says goodbye, she means it. Tell me about her. Anna, Anna interrupts my thoughts. What now? Is she talking about Helena again? What do you want to know? More information about Mrs. Lincoln will only worsen her mood. Tell me about your business arrangement. Well, that's easy enough. I'm a silent partner. I'm not particularly interested in the beauty business, but she's built it into a successful venture. I just invested and helped her get started. Why? I owed it to her. Oh? When I dropped out of Harvard, she loaned me a hundred thousand, a hundred grand to start my business. You dropped out? It wasn't my thing. I did two years. Unfortunately, my parents were not so understanding. Yeah, what? Grace scowls at me, her expression apoplectic. I want to leave. I'm going to start my own company. Doing what? Investments. Christian, what do you know about investments? You need to finish college. Mom, I have a plan. I think I can do this. Look, son, this is a huge step that could affect your entire future. Sorry. Look, son, this is a huge step that could affect your entire future. I know, Dad, but I can't do it anymore. I don't want to live in Cambridge for another two years. Transfer. Come back to Seattle. I'm never going to get this right. Transfer. Come back to Seattle. Mom, it's not the place. You just haven't found your niche. My niche is out in the real world, not in academia. It's stifling. Have you met someone? Grace asks. No, I lie smoothly. I knew Elena before I went off to Harvard. Grace narrows her eyes and tips her, and the tips of her, my ears burn. We cannot condone this reckless move, son. Carrick is summoning his full pompous prick dad mode, and I worry he's going to give me his signature... Study hard, work hard, and family first lecture. Grace emphasizes her point. Christian, you're gambling with the rest of your life. Mom, Dad, it's done. I'm sorry to disappoint you again. My decision is already made. I'm just informing you. But what about the wasted tuition? My mother is wringing her hands. Shit. I'll pay you back. How? And how in heaven's name are you going to start a business? You need capital. Don't worry about that, Mom. It's in hand, and I will pay you back. Christian, darling, it's not about the money. The only lesson I learned at college was how to read <coughs> a balance sheet, and I found the piece that the sing that single skulls bought me. <clears throat> you didn't seem to have done too badly dropping out. What was your major? Anna says, bringing me back to our conversation. Politics and economics. So, she's rich? Anna is fixated on Elena's loan to me. She was a bored trophy wife, Anastasia. Her husband was wealthy, big in timber. This always makes me smile. I give Anna a sideways smirk. Lincoln Timber. What an unpleasant asshole he's turned out to be. He wouldn't let her work. You know, he was controlling. Some men are like that. Really? A controlling man? Anna sounds scornful. Surely a mythical creature. Sarcasm drips off every word. She's in a sassy mood, but her response makes me grin. She lent you her husband's money? She sure did. That's terrible. He got his... He got his own back. That asshole. My thoughts take a dark turn. He nearly killed his wife because she was fucking me. I shudder to think what he'd have done to her if I hadn't shown up. Fury surges through my body and I clutch the steering wheel as we wait for the Escala garage barrier to open. 
Blood drains from my knuckles. Elena was in the hospital for three months and she refused to press charges. Control yourself, Gray. I relax my hold on the steering wheel. How? asks Anna, as curious as ever, wanting to know about Link's rage, Link's revenge. I'm not telling her that story. I shake my head and park in one of my allotted sp spaces and turn off the ignition. Come, Franco will be here shortly. In the elevator, I glance down at her. The little V is there between her brows. She's pensive, maybe processing what I told her. Or is it something else? Still mad at me, I ask? Very. Okay, at least I know. Taylor has returned from visiting Sophie, his daughter. He greets us when we arrive in the foyer. Good afternoon, sir, he says quietly to me. Has Welch been in touch? Yes, sir. And everything's arranged. Excellent. How's your daughter? She's fine. Thank you, sir. Good. We have a hairdresser arriving at one. Franca, Franco De Luca. Miss Steele. Taylor greets Anna. Hi, Taylor. You have a daughter? Yes, ma'am. How old is she? She's seven. Anna looks confused. She lives with her mother, Taylor explains. Oh, I see. She says and gives a ra and gives... Oh, I see, she says, and he gives her a rare smile. I turn and head into my living room. I'm not sure I appreciate Taylor charming Miss Steele or vice versa. I hear Anna behind me. Are you hungry? I ask. I am so sorry, guys. I, I am screwing up the voices left, right, and sideways today. Are you hungry? I ask. She shakes her head and her eyes scan the room. She hasn't been here since the awful day she left me. I want to tell her I'm glad she's back, but she's mad at me right now. I have to make a few calls. Make yourself at home. Okay, she says. In my study, on my desk, I find a large cloth bag. Inside is a stunning silver mask with navy plumes for Anna. Beside it, there's a small Chanel bag containing a red lipstick. Taylor has done well. However, I don't think Anna will be too impressed with my lipstick idea. At least not at the moment. I place the mask on a shelf and pocket the lipstick, then sit down at my computer. It was an enlightening and diverting morning with Anastasia. She's been as challenging as ever since we woke. Whether it was about the check for her death trap of a beetle, my relationship with Elena, or who pays for breakfast. Anna's fiercely independent and still doesn't seem interested in my money. She doesn't take, she gives. But then she's always been that way. It's refreshing. All of my submissives used to love their gifts. Gray, who are you kidding? They said they did, or perhaps that was because of the role they were playing. I put my head into my hands. This is difficult. I'm on uncharted I'm on an uncharted course with Anna. Her anger toward Elena is unfortunate. Elena is a friend. Is Anna jealous? I can't help my past, and after all that Elena has done for me, it's gonna be awkward dealing with Anna's hostility. Is this what my life will be like from now on, mired in the this uncertainty? It will make an interesting topic to discuss with Flynn the next time I see him. Perhaps he can coach me through this. Shaking my head, I activate the iMac and check my emails. Welch is sent, sent through a copy of Layla's forged concealed weapons license. She's using the name Gina, Bre uh, Gina Barry and an address in Belltown. The photograph of her likeness, the, though she looks older, thinner, and sadder than she did when I knew her, it's depressing. The woman needs help. I print out a couple of spreadsheets from SIP, P and L for the last three years that will, I will examine later. Then I review the resumes of the additional close protection team that Taylor has approved. Two of them are ex-feds and two are ex-Navy SEALs, but I have yet to broach the subject of additional security with Anna. One step at a time, Gray. When I've finished responding to the few work emails, I go in search of Anna. She's not in the living room or my bedroom, but while, the, while there, I collect a couple of condoms from my bedside and continue my search. I want to go upstairs to check whether she's in the subs room, but I hear the elevator doors and Taylor greeting someone. My watch reads 1255. Franco must have arrived. The doors to the foyer open, and before Taylor opens his mouth, I say, I'll fetch Miss Steele. Very good, sir. Let me know as soon as the security de detail gets here. 
Will do, Mr. Gray. And thank you for the mask and lipstick. You're welcome, sir. Taylor closes the doors. Upstairs I could see her, but I hear her. Upstairs I can't see her, but I hear her. And is talking to herself in the closet. The hell is she doing in there? Taking a deep breath, I open the door. She's sitting cross-legged on the floor. There you are. I thought you'd run off. She holds up a finger and I realize that she's on the phone and not talking to herself at all. Leaning against the door jam, I watch as she tucks her hair behind her ear and starts winding a strand around her index finger. Sorry, Mom. I have to go. I'll call again soon. She's jittery. Do I make her feel that way? Perhaps she's hiding in here to get away from me. She needs some space. The thought is disheartening. Love you too, Mom. She hangs up and turns to me, her expression expectant. Why are you hiding in here, I ask. I'm not hiding. I'm despairing. Despairing? Anxiety pricks my skin. She is thinking of running. Of all this, Christian. She gestures toward the dresses hanging in the closet. The clothes. She doesn't like them. Can I come in, I ask. It's your closet. My closet? Your clothes, Anna. Slowly, I sink to the floor opposite her, trying to gauge her mood. They're just clothes. If you don't like them, I'll send them back. I sound resigned rather than conciliatory. You're a lot to take on, you know. She's not wrong. Scratching my unshaved chin, I consider what to say. Be real. Be truthful. Flynn's words ring in my head. I know. I'm trying, I reply. You're very trying, she quips. As are you, Miss Steele. Why are you doing this? She gestures between us. Her and me, she and I, Anna and Christian. You know why. I need you. No, I don't, she insists. I scrape my hands through my hair, looking for inspiration. What does she want me to say? What does she want to hear? You are one frustrating female. You could have a nice brunette submissive, one who'd say how high every time you said jump, provided, of course, she had permission to speak. So why me, Christian? I just don't get it. What should I tell her? Because I've woken up since I met her? Because my whole world has changed? It's rotating on a different axis? You make me look at the world differently, Anastasia. You don't want me for my money. You give me, I search for the words, hope. Hope for what? Everything. More, I answer. It's what Anna wanted, and now I want it too. Give her your whole pitch, Gray. I tell her she's right. I'm used to women doing exactly what I say. When I say, doing exactly what I want. It gets old. There's something about you, Anastasia, which calls to me on some deep level I don't understand. It's a siren's call, and I can't resist you. And I don't want to lose you. Whoa. Flowery, Gray. I take her hand. Don't run, please. Have a little faith in me and a little patience, please. And it's there in her sweet smile, her compassion, her love. I could bask in that look all day, every day. She places her hands on my knees, surprising me, and leans up to plant a kiss on my lips. Okay. Faith and patience. I can live with that, she says. Good, because Franco's here. She flips her hair over her shoulder. About time. Her girlish laugh is infectious and together we stand. Hand in hand we make our way downstairs and I think we might be over what was making her mad. Franco makes an embarrassing fuss over my girl. I leave them in the bathroom. I'm not sure Anna would appreciate me micromanaging a haircut. Heading back into my study, I feel tension in my shoulders, and I feel it everywhere. This morning has been out of my control, <clears throat> and though she should... She <laughs> Cut, take two, action. This morning has been out of my control, and though she says she's going to try faith and patience, I'll have to say... I'll have to... <sighs> I'll have to see if she's as good as her word. My stuttering is starting to make me read like William Shatner. I'm sorry, guys. How would that sound? Heading back to my study, I feel the tension in my shoulders. Sorry, I won't do that again. But Anna has never given me a reason to doubt her, except when she left. 
and she hurt me. I dismissed the dark thought and quickly checked my emails. Here's one from Flynn. From Dr. John Flynn, subject tonight, June 11th, 2011, 1300 to Christian Gray. Christian, are you attending your parents' benefit this evening? J.F. I respond immediately. From Christian Gray, subject tonight, June 11th, 2011, 1315 to Dr. John Flynn. Good afternoon, John. I am indeed, and I'll be accompanied by Miss Anastasia Steele. Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. I wonder what he'll make of that. I think it's the first time I've ever really followed his advice, and I'm trying my relationship with Anna Herway. So far, so confusing. I shake my head and retrieve the spreadsheets I printed out a couple of weeks of bound reports I have to read about the ship. I think I missed a word in there. I shake my head and retrieve the spreadsheets I printed out and a couple of bound reports I have to read about the shipping business in Taiwan. I'm lost in the figures from SIP. They are hemorrhaging money. Their overhead is too high. Their write-offs are astronomical. <clears throat> their production costs are rising and their staff... A movement out of the corner of my eye distracts me. Anna. <clears throat> she stands at the entrance of the living room, twisting one foot inward and looking awkward and shy. She stares, staring anxiously at me, and I know she's seeking my approval. She's stunning. Her hair glossy mane. See? I tell you he like it. Franco has followed her into the living room. You look lovely, Anna, I say and my compliment induces a fetching flush in her cheeks. My work here is done, Franco says, clapping his hands. It's time to see him out. Thank you, Franco, I say, and attempt to direct him out of my living room. He grabs Anna and kisses her on both cheeks in a rather dramatic display of affection. Never let anyone else be cutting your hair. Bellissima, Anna. I glare at him until he lets her go. This way, I say to him, to get him out. Mr. Gray, she is a jewel. I know. Here, I hand him $300. Thank you for coming on short, such short notice. It was a pleasure. A real pleasure. He pumps my hand, and not a moment too soon, Taylor appears to escort him, escort him to the foyer. Thank God. Anna is standing where I left her. <clears throat> I'm glad you kept it long. I take a strand of her hair and caress it between my fingers. So soft, I whisper. She watches me, anxious, I think. Are you still mad at me, I ask? She nods. Oh, Anna. What precisely are you mad about? No, I'm not editing that out. What precisely are you mad about? She rolls her eyes at me, and I recall a moment in her bedroom in Vancouver when she made exactly the same mistake. But that was a lifetime ago in our short relationship, and I'm sure she wouldn't let me spank her right now. Though, I want to. Yes, I want to very much. You want the list? She says. There's a list? I'm amused. A long one. Can we discuss it in bed? Thoughts of spanking Anna have gone to my groin. No. Over lunch, then. I'm hungry, and not just for food. I am not going to let you dazzle me with your sexpertise. Sexpertise? Anastasia, you flatter me, and I like it. What is bothering you specifically, Miss Steele? Spit it out. I've lost track. What's bothering me? She scoffs. Well... There's your gross invasion of my privacy, the fact that you took me to some place where your ex-mistress works, and you used to take all your lovers to have their bits waxed. You manhandled me in the street like I was a six-year-old. She's on a roll with a litany of all my misbehavior. I feel like I'm in first grade again. And to cap it all, you let your Mrs. Robinson touch you. She didn't touch me? Christ. That's quite a list. But just to clarify once more, she's not my Mrs. Robinson. She can touch you, she stresses, and her voice wavers, full of hurt. She knows where. What does that mean? 
you know, you and I don't have any rules. I never had a relationship without rules, and I never know where you're going to touch me. It makes me nervous. She's unpredictable, and she has to understand that her touch disarms me. Your touch completely, it just means more, so much more. You can't touch me, Anna. Please just accept this. She steps forward, raising her hand. No. The darkness squeezes my ribs. I step back. Hard limit, I whisper. She masks her disappointment. How would you feel if you couldn't touch me? Devastated and deprived? Her shoulders fall and she shakes her head, but gives me a resigned smile. You'll have to tell me exactly why this is a hard limit one day, please. One day, I answer, and I push the vision of a burning cigarette out of my head. <clears throat> So the rest of your list, invading your private. So the rest of your list, invading your privacy, because I know your bank account number. Yes, that's outrageous. I do background checks on all my submissives. I'll show you. I head into my study, and she follows, wondering if this is a good idea. I pull Anna's file from the cabinet and hand it to her. She glances at her neatly typed name and gives me a withering look. You can keep it, I tell her. Well, gee, thanks, she sneers and starts flipping through it and scanning the contents. So, you knew I worked at Clayton's? Yes. It wasn't a coincidence. You didn't just drop by, fess up Gray. No. This is fucked up, you know that. I don't see it that way. What I do, I have to be careful. But this is private. I don't misuse the information. Anyone can get a hold of it if they have the half a mind to, Anastasia. To have control, I need information. It's how I've always operated. You do misuse the information. You deposited $24,000 that I didn't want into my account. I told you, that's what Taylor managed to get for your car. Unbelievable, I know, but there you go. But the Audi, Anastasia, do you have any idea how much money I make? Why should I? I don't need to know the bottom line of your bank account, Christian. I know that's one of the things I love about you. Anastasia, I earn roughly $100,000 an hour. Her lips form the letter O. And for once she remains silent. $24,000 is nothing. The car, the test book, the clothes, they're nothing. <clears throat> if you were me, how would you feel about all this largesse coming your way, she asks. This is irrelevant. We're talking about her, not me. I don't know, I shrug, because it's such a ludicrous question. She sighs as if she's had to explain a complex equation to a simpleton. It doesn't feel great. I mean, you're very generous, but it makes me uncomfortable. I've told you this often enough. I want to give you the world, Anastasia. I just want you, Christian, not all the add-ons. They're part of the deal, part of what I am, who I am. She shakes her head and seeming subdued. Shall we eat? She asks, changing the subject. Sure. I'll cook. Good. Otherwise, there's food in the fridge. Mrs. Jones is off on the weekends? I nod. So you eat cold cuts most weekends? No. Oh? I take a deep breath, wondering how the, this piece of information I'm going to give Anna will go down. My submissives cook, Anastasia. Some, well, some not so well. Oh, of course, she fakes a smile. What would Sir like to eat? Whatever Madam can find, I reply, knowing she won't get the reference. She nods and exits my study, leaving her file. Placing it back in the filing cabinet, I catch sight of Susanna's file. She was, she was a hopeless cook, even worse than me. But she tried, and we had some fun with that. You've burned this. Yes, sorry, sir. Well, what are you going to do with it? What are we going to do with you? Whatever pleases you, master. Did you burn this deliberately? Her flush and a twitch of her hips as she masks her smile are answer enough. Those were pleasurable and simpler times. My previous relationships were dictated by a set of rules that were followed, and if they weren't, there were consequences. I had peace, and I knew what was expected of me. There were intimate relationships, but none of my previous submissives thrilled me as Anna does, even though she's so difficult. Maybe it's because she's so difficult. I remember our contract negotiations. She was difficult then. 
Yes. Look how that turned out, Gray. She had me on my toes since I met her. It was this way. Is this why I like her so much? How long will I feel this way? Probably as long as she stays, because deep down I know she'll leave me eventually. They all do. Music starts blaring from the living room. Crazy in Love by Beyonce. Is Anna sending me a message? I stand in the corridor that leads to my study and, and the TV room and watch her cook. She's whisking some eggs, but she stops suddenly, and from what I can see, she's grinning like a fool. I creep up behind her and slip my arms around her, startling her. Interesting choice of music. I croon in her ear and plant a kiss behind it. Your hair smells good. She shimmies out of my arms. I'm still mad at you, she says. How long are you going to keep this up? I ask and rake my hand through my hair in frustration. At least until I've eaten. Her tone is haughty but playful. Good. Picking up the remote, I switch off the music. Did you put that on your iPod? Did you put that on your iPod? Anna asks. I shake my head. I don't want to say it was Layla because she might get mad again. Don't you think she was trying to tell you something back then? She says, guessing correctly that it was Layla. Well, with hindsight, probably. I reply, why didn't I see this coming? Anna asks why it's still on my iPod, and I offer to remove it. What would you like to hear? Surprise me, she says, and it's a challenge. Very well, Miss Steele, your wish is my command. I scroll through the iPod, dismissing several tunes. I consider Please Forgive Me by David Gray, but that's too obvious and frankly too apologetic. I know. What did she call it earlier? Sexpertise? Yes. Use it, seducer Gray. I've had enough of her crankiness. I find the song I want. Hit play. Perfect. The orchestra swells and the music fills the room with a cool, sultry intro. And then Nina Simone sings... I uh, put a spell on you. Anna whirls around, armed with a whisk, and I catch and hold her gaze as I move toward her. You're mine, Nina sings. You're mine. Christian, please, Anna whispers when I reach her. Please what? Don't do this. Do what? This. She's breathless. Are you sure? I take the whisk out of her hand before she decides to use it as a weapon. Anna, Anna, Anna. I'm close enough to smell her. I shut my eyes and take a deep breath. When I open them, the telltale flush of desire stains her cheeks. And it's there between us, that familiar pull. Our intense attraction. I want you, Anastasia, I whisper. I love and I hate and I love and arguing you. Arguing with you, it's very new. I need to know that we're okay. It's the only way I know how. She closes her eyes. My feelings for you haven't changed, she says, her voice low and reassuring. Prove it. Her eyelashes flutter and her eyes flit to the exposed skin above my shirt and she bites her lip. I suppress my groan as the heat radiating from our bodies warms us both. I'm not going to touch you until you say yes. My voice is thick with my hunger. But right now, after a really shitting morning, I want to bury myself in you and just forget about uh, everything but us. Her eyes meet mine. I'm going to touch your face, she says, surprising me. Okay. I ignore the frisson that runs down my spine. Her hand caresses my cheek. I close my eyes, enjoying the feel of her fingertips, teasing my stubble. Oh, baby. No need for fear, Gray. Instinctively, I press my face into her touch, experience it, luxuriating in it. I lean down, my lips close to hers, and she raises her face to mine. Yes or no, Anastasia? Yes. The word is no more than an audible sigh. And I lower my mouth to hers, my lips brushing hers, coaxing her, tasting her, teasing her, to her until she opens up for me. I embrace her, one hand on her behind, p 
pushing her against my arousal and my other hand running up her back and her soft hair where I tug gently. She moans as her tongue meets mine. Mr. Gray, we're interrupted. Christ, I release Anna. Taylor, I acknowledge through gritted teeth as he stands on the threshold of the living room, looking suitably embarrassed but resolute. What the fuck? We have an understanding that he makes himself scarce when I'm not alone in the apartment. Whatever he has to say must be important. My study, I indicate, and Taylor walks briskly across the room. Rain check. I whisper to Anna and follow Taylor out. I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. He says when we're in my office. You'd better have a good reason. Well, your mother called. Please don't tell me that's the reason. No, sir. But you should call her back sooner rather than later. It's about this evening. Okay, what else? The security team is here, and knowing how you feel about guns, I thought I should inform you that they're armed. What? Mr. Walsh and I both think it's a precautionary measure. I loathe guns. Let's hope they don't have to use them. I sound pissed, and I am. I was making out with Anastasia Steele. When have I ever been interrupted while making out? Never. The thought suddenly amuses me. I'm living in the adolescence I never had. Taylor relaxes, and I know it's because my mood has changed. Did you know Andrea was getting married today? I ask him, because this has been bugging me since this morning. Yes, he answers with a puzzled expression. She didn't tell me. Probably just an oversight, sir. Now I know he's patronizing me. I raise an eyebrow. The wedding is at the Edgewater, he says quickly. She's staying there? I believe so. Can you discreetly inquire if the happy couple has a room there and get the, them upgraded to the best suite available and pay for it? Taylor smiled. Certainly, sir. Who's the lucky guy? That I don't know, Mr. Gray. I wonder why Andrea has been so mysterious about her wedding. I brush aside the thought of the, as the aroma of something delicious filters into the room and my stomach growls in anticipation. I'd better get back to Anastasia. Yes, sir. Was that all? Yes. Great. We both exit my study. I'll brief them in ten, I say to Taylor when we're back in the living room. Anna is bending over the stove, retrieving a couple of plates. We'll be ready, Taylor says and departs, leaving me alone with Anastasia. Lunch, she offers. Please, I sit down at one of the bar stools where she's laid out places for us. Problems, she inquires as curious as ever. I have yet to tell her about the additional security. No. She doesn't push me for any answers as she busies herself plating our lunch of Spanish omelets with salad. I'm impressed she's so capable and at ease in the kitchen. She sits beside me as I take a bite and the food melts in my mouth. Mmm, delicious. This is good. Would you like a glass of wine? No, thank you, she replies and gingerly starts eating her lunch. At least she's eating. I forego the wine, as I know I'll be drinking this evening. Which reminds me that I have to call my mother. I wonder what she wants. She doesn't know I split up with Anna. And now we're back together. I should let her know that Anna is coming to the ball this evening. Using the remote, I switch on some relaxing music. What's this? Anna asks. Cantalube, Songs of the Av... Arvignon? I don't know. This is called Bolero. It's lovely. What language is it? I'm sorry, guys, if I gave up on that word. I'm having enough trouble with English today. It's an old French. Occitan, in fact. You speak French. Do you understand it? Some words, yes. My mother had a mantra. Musical instrument, foreign language, martial art. Elliot speaks Spanish. Me and I speak French. Elliot plays guitar. I play piano. And Mia the cello. Wow. And the martial arts? Elliot does judo. Mia put her foot down at age 12 and refused. Anna knows I kickbox. I wish my mother had been that organized. Dr. Grace is formidable when it comes to the accomplishments of her children. She must be very proud of you. I would be, Anna says warmly. Oh, baby, you couldn't be more wrong. Nothing is that simple. I've been a big disappointment to my folks. School, expulsions, dropping out of college... No relationships that they ever knew of. If Grace only knew the truth, of the truth about my lifestyle. If you only knew the truth, Anna. Don't go there, Gray. 
Have you decided what you'll wear this evening, or do I need to come and pick something for you? Um, not yet. Did you choose all those clothes? No, Anastasia, I didn't. I gave a list of your sizes to a personal shopper at Neiman Marcus. They should fit. Just so you know, I have ordered additional security for this evening and the next few days. With Layla unpredictable and unaccounted for somewhere on the streets of Seattle, I think it's a wise precaution. I don't want you going out unaccompanied, okay? She looks a little stunned, but agrees, surprising me by acquiescing without argument. Good. I'm going to brief them. I shouldn't be long. They're here? Yes. She looks puzzled, but she hasn't objected to the additional security, so while I have the upper hand, I pick up my empty plate and place it in the sink and leave Anna to finish her meal in peace. The security team is gathered in Taylor's office. Seated in his round table, after our introductions, I sit down and run through the evening's events. Briefing finished, I return to my study and call my mother. Darling, how are you? She enthuses into the phone. I'm well, Grace. Are you coming this evening? Of course, and Anastasia is coming too. She is? She sounds surprised, but she recovers quickly. That's wonderful, sweetheart. I'll make room at our table. She sounds t she sounds too exuberant. I can only imagine her delight. I'll see I'll see you this evening, mother. I look forward to it, Christian. Goodbye. There's an email from Flynn. From Dr. John Flynn, subject tonight, June 11th, 2011, 1425, to Christian Gray. I look forward to meeting Anastasia, J.F. I bet you do, John. It seems everyone is thrilled I have a date tonight. Everyone, including me. And that, my dear friends, is where we're going to leave it today. Like I said, this is a particularly long chapter. <sighs> And I have got places to be. So stay tuned for the rest of this chapter and the oncoming chapters. I'm not going to lie to you and say that um, I won't make any more double videos for a single chapter. Because this, yeah, like E.L. James has no brevity in this book whatsoever. Every single day in here just seems to be completely action-packed. I mean, not completely action-packed. It's not like a Jason Bourne movie or anything like that. I'm just saying that a lot happens in every single day in Darker. And as you know, every chapter in the book is a day and only a day. But you know what you're going to do. Like right now, I'm trying to find the place to mark a later chapter in the book. Oh, right there. All right, perfect. All right, so until next time, guys, this is Couch Potato Mike reminding you that in the end, we're all stories, so let's make them good ones. See you next time, guys.